Welcome to the shooting show. This week, Byron Pace is tinkering with a thermal imaging rifle scope. Plus Chris Dalton is hunting down a rogue stag in a protected forestry area. Over the last couple of days, I've been undertaking an exclusive review for the shooting show. Sent to me by Scott Country, this is the Optics Identifier, which is the first commercially available thermal rifle scope on the market. He launched a little bit later this year at the CLA Game Fair. Putting it through its paces up in the sky, some of the most rugged terrain around, we've been with Scott McKenzie trying to get in to a couple of foxes to see what this unit is all about and use it in exactly the kind of scenario that it's designed for. What I'll do today is give you a quick run through of how it works, how it operates, how to zero it, um, a few little intricacies of it, and then I'll keep quiet and let you see a little bit of footage of how we got on when we were up in sky. First things first, you need to be able to mount the thermal onto your rifle. Ideally, you want to fit it to a weaver type rail just to give you that flexibility with movement because you're going to need to be able to butt your eye up right against the scope in order to be comfortable. We've got a, a quick detach system built into the scope itself which works very well. Today I've got it mounted on uh, a Ruger American which is a uh, budget Ruger rifle which I have reviewed on the shooting show previously and over the last couple of months I've been shooting it a fair amount it's been used in all the outings that I've done for the show and it's performing admirably all round. Back to the optics thermal scope and the first thing you're going to want to do is power up. To do that you've got a little wheel on the back if you undo it it uncouples the battery carrier tray which comes out here it's a little snug so you'll have to prise it out a bit. There are two different trays available that come with the unit we've got this one here which is the smaller of the two and there is also an extendable one which allows you to put four bigger lithium batteries in and give you an extended life. In terms of how well uh, the batteries have lasted, I've been very impressed. Throughout all the filming and shooting that we did on Sky, my initial testing of it and uh, the, the range work that I'm doing today, I've used these same four C123s and according to the unit, we've still got 100% battery, so you can't ask for more than that. We'll just have to see when eventually they run out. I'm going to have to do a bit more shooting before we get there, obviously. With that done and put back in, you then simply need to turn it on. If it's the first time that you've inserted your lithium batteries, you're going to want to do one step before you turn it on, and that is hold the brightness button down at the same time as turning it on and once you've turned on the unit, continue to hold the brightness button down until the display lights up and then you can let it go. And that just allows the unit to register the fact that you're using lithium batteries. Once you've done it once, assuming that you continue to use it through its life, which you probably will because those are the batteries that it's provided with, you don't need to do it again. With the unit on, there is a slight delay before it uh, lights up, you get the optic sign and then it will click like a camera which is just how it basically sets itself and then you will be able to see the crosshair and have uh, a view and image. The primary button that is going to be of use to you while you're actually operating the unit is going to be the brightness. And the brightness is very simply adjusted by hitting this button at the back there's three set brightness uh, settings and there is also a manual option as well which allows you to, to tweak it just the way that you want it. If you want to access the menu settings, you do that by depressing these two buttons down at the same time. That 
will then allow you to, to scroll through reticle, battery type, brightness, and NUC type. The only thing that you're going to really want to um, access inside there is going to be the reticle type. The brightness can be accessed outside the menu, as I've already explained. If you go into the, the reticle, now your brightness button is basically your OK button. And inside there, we can see uh, position at the top. That is basically stored positions, which actually allows you to zero the rifle scope at different distances and then access those positions in the menu. So what you could do is zero this at 100 yards, and if you were forced to take a shot out at 200 yards, you would click position two, for example, which was your 200 yard zero. Below that, you've got your on-off. You don't have to use this with a crosshair. And in actual fact, the first night that we were in Sky, we didn't have um, time to zero the rifle because we arrived a little bit late. So we opted just to use this thermal imaging scope as a spotter. There's a handle which is att attaches on the side here and it fits nicely in the palm of your hand. And we were just using it to scan with this rifle actually that the scope's on now, set up with the Swarovski scope. Below that, you've got your up, down, left, right. This is how you zero the rifle scope. Now, this is very, very simple to zero. It's basically the same as zeroing in any rifle scope that you will have used before. You can bore sight it just the same, look down the bore, have a look up at the crosshair and move it in line with the, the uh, target that you're looking at. The one thing that you will have to bear in mind that because you're moving it on an X and Y axis, it basically just gives you an X and a Y and a coordinate when it's centered at zero and you'll have to move it into positive and negative numbers in order to, to get it on target, is that you've got to treat it like you're actually bore sighting a rifle. So everything's the opposite way around. If you take a shot, as I have done previously here, and your bullet is high, I was about four inches high or so, you actually want to move the reticle up, not down. Once you've done it a couple of times, you'll soon get to grips with it. Uh, the other options are the actual color. So if we scroll down, scroll down that, we have white, we have black, and we have auto. Now, as anybody who has used um, thermal will know, most thermal scopes will give you an option of black heat or white heat. So if you have it on auto, it auto corrects the color of the crosshair to be the opposite um, for whatever you, whatever setting that you've got it on. So once you've got that set, it's probably better just to keep that on auto. Uh, then your next option is the actual type. So you do have a variety of different crosshairs that you can choose from, and that's really down to personal preference. And then lastly, exit, and you're back out to where you started with. And that is really all there is to this scope. Um, it's not overly complicated to use. Uh, if you want to focus it, you've simply got two really nice, easily gripped rings at the front and at the back. The back will focus the actual reticle itself. For your landscape focusing, you use the ring at the front. And lastly, this port on the side is just a video output. So if you want to capture any of the the footage um, output from what you're actually shooting, that's where you would plug it in. Moving on to the actual field applications of this unit, the first thing that I need to mention is how you go about zeroing a thermal rifle scope. Now, it may seem obvious to some, but you can't simply go and put up a white sheet of paper on your standard shooting board and hope to see what you're looking at. Thermals rely on a difference in temperature to pick up on the screen and identify what the image is that's being shown through the viewer. So if we look at a landscape like this, when we were looking at rabbits up on those banks, the ground and the grass is a lot cooler than the body heat of the rabbits, and that is how you're able to pick it up. And that is also why you can use a thermal during the day. It doesn't need to be cold and at night or dark. It's just differences in temperature that the thermal picks up. So what I've done uh, here is get one of these um, hand warmer pads. These are disposable, they don't cost a great deal. As soon as you take them out of the packet, they immediately start to heat up. And I've pinned one of these to a white sheet of paper on my board. And that is enough 
um, thermal heat from that to be able to pick it up on the scope and the white sheet of paper just allows me to see if, if my bullet hasn't quite gone where I'm expecting it. And with that pinned up there, you end up with a, a really nice um, central zeroing position to get the rifle on target and where you want it. And I went through that um, process a little bit earlier and within two shots, I was pretty much on the mark and, and very happy with the results. If you don't have um, one of these, what we did up in Sky when we were just checking zero for Scott and Eden um, to have a go of the rifle was we had a, a dog food tin that we had pinned to a board again with a white sheet of paper behind it. We just got a blowtorch and heated up the, the little circular piece of tin which held its heat long enough for us to take a couple of shots at it and check zero. In terms of hunting with the unit, you're probably going to want to restrict yourself to about 200 yards. It's not that it won't pick up heat sources beyond that. I was looking at rabbits at 550 on the hill behind me, and there's some cattle in the field up the valley at, in excess of 1500 meters, and I could pick them up quite easily with the thermal scope. But you do need to be able to identify with 100% certainty what you are shooting before you pull the trigger. At more than 200 yards, with a fox size object, it will become increasingly difficult with this. And for that reason, um, in terms of safety and ethics, I would say 200 yards is probably about your limit. You do have the ability to zoom in with this, and that's simply operated by pressing this button at the front. Pressing it once doubles uh, the size of the image. Pressing it again doubles it further. We found that using the four times magnification you lost a lot of clarity of the image, so we didn't find it particularly useful. What we were tending to do was use no zoom to uh, locate what it is that we were looking for and then take it up to two times magnification to place that accurate shot. A little bit earlier, I went down the road to an embankment that I know there are a large number of rabbits on, uh, causing havoc with the game crop on top of the hill. I did that to get a bit of practice with the thermal scope in this setup. It is very important to do this. As anybody who has used a handheld thermal viewer will know, judging distance at night with a thermal image is incredibly difficult. The best way to do it is to get objects that you know the rough dimensions of and you know what the actual ranges are and see how much of the crosshair they fill. So, Settle on a crosshair type on the scope that you're going to stick with. And with that set, over a bit of time and practice, especially um, if you're practicing shooting rabbits, you will soon get to know what a rabbit or a fox looks like and how much of your crosshair it fills at certain ranges. And eventually you'll get to a point where you'll be able to watch foxes coming in and as they cross the point of say 150 yards, you know that's a takeable shot uh, with the setup and rifle that you have and the caliber that you're shooting and you'll be able to take that shot knowing what the, the fox image looks like on either no magnification or two times magnification on the unit. But getting that practice in and um, knowing your ranges, um, especially if you're not going to take out a spotlight as well for you to be able to to ping ranges with a rangefinder is going to be very important to make um, efficient and ethical use of a unit like this. Byron with the Optics Thermal Scoping Tour heads back to Sky. He's meeting Eden Anand and Scott McKenzie to try the thermal imager unit out against a marauding fox. A delayed start means that the boys don't have time to zero the unit to tonight's hunting combo, so it'll be used as a handheld spotter, with Scott on lamp and thermal duties and Eden behind the rifle. While Eden takes the more traditional approach with binos, Scott scans with the optics thermal. Without the weight of a rifle to aid us, the sight picture is shakier, but nevertheless, Scott is soon picking up wildlife with ease. Soon enough a fox comes in and begins to make its way down the basin, though all the while staying out of shooting range. Scott, 
just talk me through what's happened in the last 45 minutes? Right, well, we've come into this area up on the high ground on the hill here. And the, the view out here is great because it's, it's a big, big open basin in front of us, surrounded by a high ridge. And it's a good area to just have a call and sit and wait. And uh, I, we've, we've sat for about 20 minutes on and off calling. And sure enough, we've had a fox come in. But with the wind, he's, I fear he's just cut us a wee bit. He's just caught our scent, but not enough to spook him. And he's just come round in a big, big arc and sat off about 400 metres away. He was really coming in though, wasn't he? He was, he was coming in thick and fast. He had a trot about him, but uh, like I say, I think the wind's just, it swirls around in this basin. He's just caught a sniff of us and it's, it's just made him a wee bit weary. Using the thermal, how was that? I mean, you've used thermal before, but talk me through the advantages of it tonight. Well, that fox in particular, we were, like I say, we were calling on and off for 20 minutes, and as the light's fading, it's got more difficult to see. And it wasn't until I picked up the uh, thermal imager, switched it on, and had a sweep about that I picked that fox up. I took the thermal imager away from my eye just to, just to see if I could see with the eye. Couldn't see a thing, but as soon as I put the thermal imager back out there, I, like I say, I mean, it's, uh, I wouldn't have picked that fox up without it, that was for sure. And we were able to drag it for quite some time. It was impossible to pick up with them, with, even with great optics, just impossible. Yeah, even with you know grade A optics, we, we struggled to pick him out amongst the peat hags, the grass, the heather. Um, but yeah, testament to the thermal imaging, it's, it's made it possible to see where he's gone to and uh, where he's sat up. So we'll give him a wee while, let the light fade a wee bit and see if we can stalk into him with the lamp and pick him up again. Charlie appears to have given the boys a slip on this occasion, but we've still had an excellent demonstration of what this new unit is capable of. Next time, the fox won't be so lucky. Byron there, getting to grips with thermal imaging. And now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News, with the CLA Game Fair now less than three weeks away. A report on the BBC's rural coverage has been leaked and it says the organisation is failing rural viewers, including shooters. The report is expected to say that the BBC does not reflect the real economic and social concerns of countryside dwellers. It will also criticise the BBC for axing its rural affairs correspondent last year. But there is still doubt over whether the report will lead to real executive action. Basque Chief Executive Richard Ali said the corporation needs to go further to redress the balance between urban and rural concerns. More and more exhibitors are revealing what they'll have in store at the CLA Game Fair. Edgar Brothers will host an array of shooting celebrities at their stand, including Steve Hornady, Paolo Zolli and Melanie Sykes. There'll also be new products from Benelli, Steiner, Browning and Longform Guns, among others. On top of that, there's a full set of clay shooting competitions, the chance to win shooting lessons with the Oxford Gun Company, and if you're bored of all that, how about some top-level polo? See the full list of attractions at gamefair.co.uk. Less than a month out from the Commonwealth Games, British shooters have tasted success in an international event. Steve Scott was crowned European champion, taking gold in the men's double trap at the Euros in Hungary. He emerged the victor from a tight sudden-death shoot-off with Russia's Vasily Mosin. At the same championships, James Dedman secured a silver in junior double trap. For a full report, don't miss Clay Shooting magazine. And finally, the RSPCA will shift its focus back to frontline work instead of prosecutions, it has told the press. Last year, the charity spent more than half a million pounds on prosecutions against hunts. Shooting organisations said it was bidding to become the second largest prosecutor after the CPS. But after the departure of Chief Executive Gavin Grant, the organisation is now going to refocus on its animal welfare work. It's also going to cut staff and restructure. That was the Shooting Show News. It's first light on the Ayrshire-Dumfriesshire border, and Chris Dalton is out once more. It may be the middle of the roebuck season, but he's got a different species in mind. Stalking to the edge of a moor, Chris is soon in among his quarry. It's a red stag. There's a large group of them in the area and they're terrorising a new hardwood plantation. It's not the time of year for reds, but Chris is certified with an out-of-season licence and this is a protection exercise that just can't wait. 
Chris is quickly behind the rifle, and cameraman Stuart homes in on a fine stag browsing nearby. But Stuart didn't spot a much younger stag further to the left, which is a far more suitable animal for Chris to take. We catch it on camera as it runs into shot. Chris watches on with concern. I'm not really one for shooting deer out of season, but if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. But if we're going to do it, we're going to try and take a knob or a youngster. Yeah. And we'll let the bigger animals survive. We want their genes passing on anyway. Yeah. Um, but the damage that's been done, there were 18 stags, uh, big stags mainly, last night out on the plantation. And an enormous amount of damage. If we've taken the sort of animal we want, which yeah. is the young knobber, well, it's a little bit bigger than a knobber, but and that'll maybe deter them yeah. and push them back into the forest a little bit. Literally planted within the last two weeks is a huge uh, banking of, of hardwoods being planted. They're migrating from the forest, coming down either onto this banking, but they've been concentrating on the planted area up on the top behind us. Right. Um, the stag dropped after running on a few more yards. As the light comes up, Chris and his hound, Oscar, head in to retrieve the beast, and it's clear the ammo has done its job well. First time I've used the 243 this morning and the shot placement absolutely bang on the money. Shot was 125 yards, um, quite poor visibility. So it's quite again quite impressed the Swarovski scope good. Yeah. Um, nice bit of kit again. Um, well moderated as well, the rifle was very little recoil on the rifle. To my mind the animal we take out is very selectively taken out. Yeah. I mean the young stagger here, good condition, and absolutely. I mean this is going into the food chain anyway, so it'd be good eating. Yeah. But we've left uh, there. We have two really uh, big mature stags. One would definitely a royal. The other one possibly not far behind yeah. it. Um, they're going to spread the genes on. I think, to be honest with you, even though we got to shoot deer this morning, if we could, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have taken either of those. No. We would have pro progressed further on, and we'd have got a uh, maybe a knob of car for something, just yeah. enough to deter them. Yeah. Um, and that's probably as much as I would want to do. Shooting stags out of season in vulnerable plantations is all part of this professional deer manager's lot and is a crucial exercise towards tree survival. With the Gralic swiftly completed, we can proceed to the extraction. This might only be a small stag, but it's still a weighty creature. Getting it into the vehicle turns out to be a two-man job. I had a call uh, two days ago from the forest manager to ask me to go down and have a look because he'd 18 reds on a, a new plantation a grant scheme and asked me to, to shoot one of them if I could to try and deter them. I'm not a great one for shooting uh, stags at this time of year if I can help it, but we do have an out-of-season licence and it is a very necessary uh, function. Stuart, the cameraman, was, was avidly filming one of the nice stags, but he hadn't noticed a, a knob of stag at the back of the group. Um, so, say, so we got into position. I shot the, the knobber, which is the one I would prefer to shoot in those conditions. I wouldn't have shot the two big stags in velvet anyway. Um, and Stuart was filming nicely the... Uh, the largest stag while the knobber sort of ran through shot uh, and dropped down after about a 30-40 metre dash. Again demonstrating quite admirably that the uh, the gecko in the 243 you know, did, did very nicely on a fairly big stag. That's probably about 75 kilo in the larder, so that's sort of a big beastie. With the stag in the larder, an unexpected but justified stalking mission draws to a close. Finally, Chris can get back to the books. Well that's it for this week, thank you for watching, please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been The Shooting Show.